Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode. I appreciate you joining me. Uh, before I kick this episode off, I just wanted to announce a couple things. Uh, first one being is uh, I did finally release my first hunting video on YouTube. <laughs> it's, a, it's a little video. It's about 14 minutes long of uh, this spring bear hunt where I, I kind of tell the story of how I did the whole uh, bear baiting thing here in North Idaho and how that all came together. So check it out. The uh, link to that is going to be in the show notes of this episode. If you just jump on the show notes and go to where it says like link tree, uh, it'll take you to this place where you can click on YouTube and it'll take you right to the video basically. So uh, you'll have to find the spring bear, North Idaho spring bear hunt 2022 and it's the first time I finally, out of all the filming I've done, I finally put together a video from it all. Uh, it took me a while because I'm not super good at it. So <laughs> uh, let me know what you guys think of that. It was kind of fun putting it together. Last week, I had the opportunity to head over to, like, Cody. We stayed in Cody, Wyoming, and uh, which is about 20, 30 minutes or so out of Powell, Wyoming, which is where Eastman's Hunting Journals is headquartered. And I got the uh, honor and the pleasure to sit down with a few guys from the Eastman's team and record some episodes. So that's uh, this is the first of two. I've got uh, the legendary Ike Eastman on this episode. You guys are going to like this discussion. Uh, you, you guys know how we like to push the envelope over here. And so we, we talk a little bit about that and some of the some of the things in the, and the negative nuances surrounding the the topic of uh, what we call trophy hunting and how like how we see it as hunters how how hunters see what trophy hunting is uh, the good and the bad versus what like the general public sees as trophy trophy hunting because of the way the anti hunting community likes to portray what uh, they call trophy hunting because in their mind everything is trophy hunting it's uh, li like for example that video i just released and and uh, where i got that that little bear they would call that trophy hunting just for the sake of the the fact that i'm, I'm hunting and so it's an important conversation so i'd like to get your guys's feedback on that jim at the western huntsman.com is my email to send that over to me i'd love to read it and last but not least uh if you guys are not following the western huntsman on instagram i'd sure appreciate if you jump on over there and give us a follow there and there those there's two ways you could really help the show grow and one is uh, is following on instagram i'm not totally sure why that is but it's a it's an important indicator and so it's it's really helpful if you're not following us if you like the show uh check us out on instagram at the western huntsman and give us a follow there and the other way is uh, for you guys, if you don't mind jumping on and writing us a review on Apple iTunes uh, or the Apple Podcast app, whichever. I, I think they're both basically the same thing. Again, my, I'm, I'm challenged, technolo technologically challenged. I think that's how you say it, right? <laughs> so as far as the show goes, guys, uh, I appreciate any any positive feedback uh, you, you can throw my way and, and give us a good review. That, uh, that really helps the show. goes a long way. So with that. Let's jump into it with, like I said, the legend of Ike Eastman, president of Eastman's Hunting Journals. Let's do it. There exists a threat from anti-hunting groups to politicians trying to give our land away, and we won't stand for it. Those vast western landscapes provide the space for our wildlife to thrive and a place for hunters and anglers to fuel the fire that sparks their soul. In this show, we share our love of hunting, fishing, and conservation. Here, we provide the foundation to meet these threats through passion and the grit of the American outdoorsman. Welcome to the Western Huntsman Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Western Huntsman Podcast. This is Jim Huntsman, your host. And this time, folks, I'm coming at you not from the Broken Tine Studio. We can call this the the mobile Broken Tine Studio. <laughs> right here in Powell, Wyoming, with my buddy Ike Eastman of Eastman's Hunting Journals. How you doing, brother? Oh, I'm better than I deserve, that's for sure, Jim. I appreciate Good. you having me on. I appreciate you joining me, man. This is cool. So there's a few new things happening here, though, that uh, I should make people aware of. Um, one is we're being filmed. Yeah. That's new yeah. to me. 
Um, and, and and I'm here to tell you, you got a face for radio. You know that, right? I, I that's what my, even my mom tells me that. <laughs> like I I should not be th- that that camera should not be there, man. This is nerve wracking. It adds a whole new dynamic to the whole thing. I'm used I've never to just seen hiding. You nervous. This is interesting. Yeah, I'm super nervous, man. At least we got uh, it's a cool setup though. Yeah. I I love the place here. Uh, we are in the like the headquarters building, right? Of yeah. Eastman's. Yep. Yep. Do you want to, in case somebody's been living on Mars, give yeah. a quick overview? What is Eastman's Hunting Journals? Yeah, uh, I'll give you the elevator speech. Um, so my family's been in the outdoor industry for three generations. Um, we've my grandfather started filming wildlife in the 1950s, 1957, uh, and he started. Filming wildlife in in up north in the North Country, and he'd bring that video or that not video it was it was a film back then, and he'd bring it back to Lower 48, and then he would start putting that film. He would live narrate it, so he'd go to the high school auditorium and he'd live narrate that uh, actual film and talk about what a polar bear is and what a caribou is and you know all these different oh, really? sheep that nobody knew what they were. Huh. And so it, all over the Pacific Northwest, and then it became all over the West and all over the U.S. Uh, he did some stuff in Pennsylvania. And then in the 60s, he he kind of parlayed that into filming some wildlife for Walt Disney. There was Walt Disney was doing wildlife. He went from he, at that point he went from cartoons into actual theatricals. Walt Disney did, and hmm. there was a a film called um, Run Appaloosa Run. And he, my grandfather filmed some of the, some of the footage inside that. So they'd say, Hey, Oh, he did one called, uh, something the Teton marsh. And so they needed a film of a beaver, you know, diving down and, you know, beaver doing what beaver do they do. And yeah. so my grandfather filmed this. In fact, my dad was in charge of the beaver. It was a pet beaver and they had to, he, he was 14 or whatever. And they'd go out in a canoe and throw the beaver in there and get him to do stuff. And my grandfather would film it and then send it to Walt Disney and they put it in the film. Huh. All kinds of, and then it kind of parlayed. He went to Hollywood and spent some time in Hollywood, uh, building his own theatricals that actually went to the movie theater and it was all wildlife based. He really filmed, started filming um, like wolves, and and he actually ended up. Uh, he had three generations of wolves, and uh-huh. he bring those, uh, bring uh, the first pack back into the U.S. Had them in a huge kennel in in Jackson and studied them, and then after the third generation, he took the third generation and he took them, took them back to British Columbia and let them go and spent a summer with these wolves that were like his pups. And just to make sure that they were going to survive. And it was the typical story, you know, the first couple of weeks, they wouldn't really leave him. And then they kind of ventured out. And then there was other wolves that got involved. And, it, you know, it's just a, it's a unique, kind of molded. Yeah. But oh, what year was that? Did you say? Uh, that would have been in the 70s. Gotcha. The mid 70s. Uh, my brother was born. In fact, there's photos of my brother standing against a kennel and. And uh, the, the, that third generation thought he was a wolf pup. I yeah, yeah. call him Mowgli when he was little. Huh. But he so he studied these wolves and and, um, you know, what makes a wolf tick? Because it was a you know, it's uh, the wolves is obviously in generations in different societies. The wolf is the big bad wolf. That's why we have the big bad wolf with Red Riding Hood. We have the wolf that blew over the house with the three little pigs. three little I pigs. Mean, yeah, he yeah. is he is the ultimate predator. My grandfather wanted to study it just to see what what makes a wolf tick and what's mm. unique about him. And, um, so that, and then he took that and he did some stuff in, uh, North in, uh, Alaska. He spent, uh, two winters with, uh, the Alaskan, the Eskimo people and literally spent, lived with them. Uh, the first winter was really, really, uh, horrible cause they didn't, he was an outsider. Mm-hmm. So they barely, barely, <laughs> barely took him in. Then he, uh, he and one of his buddies, uh, they would polar bear hunt is what they were doing in the winter. They'd go out there and and shoot pillow bears and they got uh crashed on the ice in airplanes and on their way Mm -hmm. back they hit a tail or a headwind and and it ran out of fuel land the plane on an ice cake and ended up uh spending three days in the middle of the winter on the icebergs uh, jumping from one iceberg to another till they found one big enough to hold both of them and a military plane finally air force actually the, the true story is that it was a Russian airplane found them. Oh, and then, really? Yeah, and then thankfully called the U.S. said, hey, you got two guys out there on the ice. I, we found them. Here's huh. the coordinates. 
And uh, first day the Air Force went by, dropped a huge, uh, you know, thing of of provisions and a and a uh, float raft and all this stuff, and it went right through the ice. Oh, that's I was going to say, did it make the ice? Nope, <laughs> went right through the ice. And I, I can't imagine standing there thinking, oh my gosh, we've been <clears throat> saved. Yeah. And watch your stuff hit the ice, go right through the ice, and disappear into the abyss. And go. Well, this isn't going to be good. We're going to have to spend another night like this. Jeez, and they spent man. another night, and then they ended up getting them. Once they did that, uh, the Eskimo people took them in because that that is a special place in their heart. Because once you've gone to the ice and been lost, you come back. I mean, you're kind of uh, revered. Like a superstition yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. So then, so they spent the next winter with them and went on a whale hunt. You know, they did it the whole old way out of skin boats and you know harpoons that they threw and they they towed this whale up and they and they harvested the whale. This is all captured on a film called North of the Sun. Um, then he did some stuff. <laughs> he was he was an adventurer, as you can tell. Um, mm-hmm. He did some stuff where he was filming. <laughs> he had a friend in Texas where the guy in Texas said, "Hey, you know you know these deer talk, right? Like elk do." What do you mean they talk? He goes, yeah, they they talk. There's there's a communication between bucks and does and does and fawns and all this stuff. And so they built this this call called uh, it was called the uh, deer talk. And you and I've I have footage this last fall of uh, on a deer hunt. One of our guys and uh, one of our buddies. We were in Montana and we couldn't get this whitetail to stand up mm-hmm. in this really thick stuff. Brandon gets on that deer call and squeaks a couple times. That buck stands up. And not only did that buck stand up, he walked towards us. And then all of a sudden, the entire uh, drainage with all this really thick foliage, every deer in the place stood up and started walking towards us like th- no there was kidding. a fawn that, in trouble. Wow. It was crazy. So huh. he, he built this deer call. Then he built uh, some cow calls. Uh, he was one of the first ones to ever actually have a mouth, a bite mouth call uh, uh-huh. for cows and uh, reeds and bugles and all that stuff. Um, and then he took the theatricals in the 80s. They took those theatricals and made them in VHS tapes. For those of you that remember what a VHS tape is for us old guys. Yeah, I still have a box of them. <laughs> Do you have a way to play them? No. I don't have a I don't have a VCR. <laughs> yeah. Do you, I, I don't even remember what VCR stands for. Uh video recording. Video, uh I don't C, know. C, I don't remember. Anyway. Eh. Um so <laughs> video cassette recorder. That's right. Yep. yep. You got it. You nailed it. You win. <laughs> so he made those into v- VHS and they went they started selling them <laughs> to these rental places. That's when my dad, my dad went to Vietnam when my grandfather was doing all the stuff up north. My dad was in Vietnam, and then he came back and he was an outfitter in Jackson Hole. And um, after he kind of got he got burned a couple times the outfitting business, sold it, and he went through a couple things. But then he ended up selling uh, these VHS tapes to video rental stores for my grandfather and went all over the country. They're, it's funny if you sat down with my dad and said, "Hey, have you ever been to uh, Tupelo? Have you ever been to Ralston, Wyoming?" Oh yeah, there used to be a video store on the third, on the second <laughs> corner in that town. Can't remember the guy's name, but he was a really nice guy, and he and I talked hunting for like an hour. So he would been to every video store out west, every one of them, and a bunch of them like Pennsylvania, Texas, down south, selling these videos. Huh. He was in a show in Pennsylvania, and uh, these guys kept going, "Oh, you're from out west, yeah? Can can." Can you t- give us some hints on how to, we really, I really want to shoot a bull elk. I really want to shoot a bull. How do you do that? And they were just dumbfounded that you could come out West and there was all this public land and you could draw a tag or back then you could buy a tag over a the lot counter. Of over the counter yeah. stuff. Yeah. And, and you could actually, this is an attainable goal and they were just dumbfounded. And so he, rather than answer the same question 30 times he just built a pamphlet said yeah here here's some information on it Hmm. would you like to buy a video kind of thing and uh it went from a pamphlet to a bigger pamphlet to a full-blown magazine and pretty soon the magazine was a large portion of his income and uh he he the videos that's about the time that video you know stores were falling apart and he went transitioned into this magazine um, and then started uh, the Bow Magazine, and then started the the. He had all this footage 
uh, when I was in high school, he and I'd go out antelope hunting or deer and we'd film it. And it was mm-hmm. the cameras were coming along just good enough that they weren't these giant film cameras. They were smaller, you know, size of a loaf of bread type camera mm-hmm. and you could film. Still we, heavy, still bulky yeah, but, compared to today, but yeah, manageable. But not a hundred pounds yeah. bulk. Yeah. And so we'd, we'd film these antelope hunts and, and these deer hunts and then he'd put them on VHS tapes. And he would sell them, or he would get, hey, if you subscribe to my magazine, I'll give you this VHS tape. It's got four kill scenes on it. Well, oh, gosh, that sounds good. So the guy <laughs> buy buy the magazine, get a VHS <laughs> tape. And so we went to the Outdoor Channel, which wasn't called the Outdoor Channel then. It was, uh, uh, it was, it was started, that guy started it was a gold pan, gold panners. They were the ones that started the Outdoor Channel. I they know what it. you're talking about, but I can't think of the name either. They bought a yeah. gold, or they bought a Christian uh, channel back then you had to have a satellite feed yep. and all this stuff. They bought this channel and then turned it into gold panning, but they couldn't fill all the time. So they started selling it to the outdoor industry, which was on TNN at the time. And they would take this, the reruns mm-hmm. from TNN and run them on the outdoor channel. And anyway, so my dad goes to the program manager and said, Hey, we have, uh, I have, I have this Western hunting show. Would you like it on the outdoor channel? And he says, the guy goes, well, you know, when you when you get a when you get a whole season film, let me know and I'll, I'll take a look. He goes, I have four seasons film. You have four seasons of Western hunting? Only, only Western big game? Yep, that's what we do. Was this a time when like the Midwestern whitetail hunts were just everything that was on TV? Actually, like Texas. Be, it was before that. It, it was. This would have been yeah. This would have been the late nineties. So, oh, okay. Like it, you know, there was only about seven or eight shows. Yeah. Uh, that really had hunting and, stuff. And they would mix it with Real like the bass tournament. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yep. I know what you're talking about. And so he took this and put it on the outdoor channel and it took off. You can imagine hmm. guys in, you know, the, the same guys in Pennsylvania down south, they, they were looking at this going, holy crap, you can actually do this. You can, you can actually go out west and hunt. I'm yeah. watching it. And so he built the TV show and it built up. And about then, uh, I came in back into the business. I was in I was in uh, banking for a number of years, and I came back into the business in the early 2000s. And um, we built it to what it is now. It's two magazines, still have a TV show. We have a whole, we have an online TV show. We have three podcasts, a huge blog, huge email list. Um, just you know, kind of the the source for Western info. And yeah. uh, we do a, a big thing in the west in the back of the magazine, and now we took a digital that's uh, MR, or MRS, which is Members Research Section. It's all about draw odds and hunting units in each western state, and we took that whole digital thing, and it's now called Eastman's Tag Hub. You can log on and search it. It's all searchable and you know functions like a, a website would you would expect, and you can narrow it down to you know I have 12 points and what can I do with them? Yeah, the, elk. the so. Tag Hub is super intuitive and user-friendly for guys like me that are not super smart but can can manage our way around because we generally know what we want to look for right and and it's easy to find yeah um so yeah i think that's a game changer so i i mean is that kind of how you see eastman's in, in terms of um what you're trying to produce is this this western hunting uh Yes. So, so, so let me, I'll give you the mission statement. We, 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 a lot of companies say this, but we actually do. We live behind this. Our company is built specifically to in, to entertain, inform in an entertaining way and help hunters become better hunters. And I'm not saying I have all the answers or my brother has all the answers or anybody in this building does. It's really built. The first half of the magazine is built by subscribers, just regular mm-hmm. Joes that went hunting and they, and you know, they took a nice trophy. They're going to show their trophy, but they also want to share the story. And every ma- every article in that magazine, you're going to learn something. You're going to learn mm-hmm. something that that guy learned. And so it's really teaching. It's a, I guess, teaching with your peers, you know, learning yeah. something from somebody just like yourself. And there's plumbers and electricians and contract workers and truck drivers. And they're, they're the, they're the stars of that magazine. Mm-hmm. And we've just taken that and, and done it again. It's podcast. What we're doing right now, the, your listeners probably learn one or two things at least probably way more than that from every episode that yeah. they didn't know before. And that's, that's the mantra. It's, you know, knowledge is king. Knowledge is power. Yep. And we're just trying to share that that information, yeah. that knowledge. And if and they're listening, do it conservatively. Exactly. And, and if, if you're listening 
uh, to my show, they, they've learned that hunting advice coming from me is exactly what not to do. So that's still a win, right? <laughs> it I mean, is. <laughs> you know what? I have a lot of flat head parts of my head from beating it against a brick wall, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, that kind of that kind of goes to um, one of the topics that we wanted to talk about, right? Yeah. And uh, this is cool, man. I've never had a, a, an interview kind of style thing on video where we're just kind of looking at each other usually it's in my hodgepodge hunting trailer and and uh, we're both uh, whatever anyways um the it kind of leads to the question like when i think of eastmans because i think anybody that's been a western hunter and i i've been a western hunter uh my entire life yeah. and and so it's it's my passion it's what i do it's why we're called the western huntsman right um you know so i think of trophy hunts when, when I think of Eastman, I think of you guys knocking over these, these 200 inch mule deer and these, these wildly huge bull elk that, that you just don't get in my neck of the woods. Yeah. I, well, that's not true. I'm just not a good enough hunter to find them. <laughs> I know they're there. Uh, but I, 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 you know, that's, I think what, what I think of. And I, I want to kind of have you explain, cause you have a unique philosophy on, on what trophy hunting is, because if you've listened to my show, you know, I've, I've ragged on the term trophy hunting because the anti hunters use it right. as like this. Um, I don't know. They use it synonymously with poaching. Yes. Yes. Like these trophy hunters are killing bears in California yes, simply right. for the trophy. Right. And, and they, they pay no attention to, you know, what, what hunting really is, what it, what it means to you, what it means to me. And so it's it's turned into this derogatory term. Yes. Oh, hunt, uh, trophy hunter, huh? The the person that goes over and just just takes an elephant for the tusks, right? Or or a bear for the skull. Uh, you, you know things that just are not applicable to ninety nine point nine 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 percent of hunters. Yeah. Because we're hunters, we're not poachers, right? Can you can you talk about what what is what is trophy hunt? How do you define trophy hunting? First of all. Yeah. So, um, you're a hundred percent right. The the trophy hunter. The word trophy hunting has been a negative connotation, and it's been used by mainstream media and anti-hunters as poaching. Mm -hmm. They are completely different. Mm -hmm. That is, that's as far from accurate as you can get. Trophy hunting. The reason that Teddy Roosevelt started an organization that has a book to keep the record of these trophies is this. Number one. It is a great way to gauge a species' health is by trophies. Mm -hmm. Number two, trophy hunting is conservation, and here's how it is. People go, how is that possible? Here's how it is. Number one, if you want to control a herd, there's two ways that you need to manage it. Number one, in size, so sheer numbers, mm -hmm. and number two, in health, and that means how healthy is that herd. When you have a when you have a 400 inch bull that is is past his prime or at the at the peak of his prime and he's almost done breeding or this will be his last year or last couple years of breeding, that bull will go around and he'll beat up the younger bulls. And what that what that means is he'll beat up the bulls that should be breeding that are vital to breeding. And in those the old bulls, the bigger bulls, and we use size as a gauge of age. It really is. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not going to have a four point. Very rare, it does happen, but you're not going to have a four point bull elk that's seven years old. That just doesn't happen. Yeah. So it's is a really quick and easy gauge for age. You want that those older bulls to be taken out of a herd so that the younger bulls, the more vital bulls, the bulls that when they breed that cow the first time it takes, you want that bull to be breeding. If you have these older bulls, these bigger bulls, and, and usually they can be, you know, Montana, my brother shot a, a, a old bull, eight year old bull that probably almost a third bigger than any other bull body size, just a giant just a monster. Yeah. Huh? Just a giant body. Well, he's going to be able to whoop up on those younger bulls and keep them from breeding. Well, he doesn't, re that old bull doesn't really breed. He goes through the actions, everything happens, but there's no, those cows don't actually take. Hmm. That is a problem with herd health because then the next year I'll send the calf crops off and two years down the road, you have a, you have a dip in the size of that herd. But wouldn't it be if, if you have, okay, you've got this eight year old bull kicking the shit out of these younger bulls, right? Yep. Preventing them from breeding and he's not breeding the cows. Yep. If you take out that eight year old, wouldn't it be that that 
that roll, same thing would happen to a six-year-old bull? Or can you explain what the difference is? Because well, a six-year-old bull would breed the cow. Is that right. what you're saying? Yeah. So okay. just no I just want to make sure we're Six, clear. 60-year-old men, and, and not often, 60-year-old men don't get 20-year-old girls pregnant. Yeah, unless Does you're, that make sense? Unless you're in... Uh, unless you're Hollywood or something. Unless shit. you're in the Playboy Mansion or something yeah, of that yeah. nature. <laughs> it just doesn't happen because that's how that's how nature works, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in order for the management of the the health of the herd, you have to be taking these trophies out. Now that's one thing. The other thing is when you have people that are out in the field trophy hunting, they're showing restraint. They're not taking out a whole generation because let's all face it, uh, three year, you know, spike elk are dumber than a box of rocks. Mm-hmm. And if you are just going to go out and shoot meat, I'm not saying you can't shoot a spike. That's not my point. But if everybody did that, yeah. you would take a generation of elk out. It, and that's a, that's a great way to put it because we've had this argument on my show many times where it's like you have, you have the, if it's brown, it's down crew. And then you, if you have the, uh, let it grow crew, right. Uh, what, there's another term for that too. Um, I anyway. call them the tag soup crew. <laughs> They're willing to eat tag soup. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's something to that. Yeah. And, and there's, I think this ties into some of the themes that we've been we've been talking about recently, where you know there, there's there's this black and white mentality in society. It has to be this way, or it has to be that no. way. There's no in between, or you're an asshole, yeah. right? And I'm looking for the people that want to have a little bit of gray area. Yep. Like it's okay if somebody shoots a spike. We're not disparaging no. them, right? No. But it's also okay if we have another group that's sh- shooting trophies, and it's okay to shoot the ones in between. And and, and here's the funny thing. I, I, I'm going to even take it further than that. Okay. The guy that's willing to eat tag soup in his 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 you know his dry area that only draws every four years, every ten years, whatever, will often, most likely, he will also have a tag a cow tag in his pocket, and that's what fills the freezer. Because this guy's eating that's this true. stuff. Yeah. It's now let me I'm gonna go into the next step of trophy hunting. The mainstream media is calling trophy hunting poaching and poaching trophy hunting mm-hmm. because they're under the impression, I have, I have a, a friend that is semi, pretty semi-famous, not in the hunting industry, but in, in the world. He and I had this conversation over a couple cocktails, and he didn't realize, he had no idea. When he thought trophy hunting was, you go shoot, you know, shoot that elephant, take the tusks, and go home. Yeah. He had no idea that that hippo that you, you were looking at my hippo school in my office. thing is crazy, by the way. He had no idea that 5,000 pounds of meat gets taken off of that hippo and they eat everything and mm-hmm. they strip it and they make they make this jerky that in my opinion is not the that's not what I would go to the fridge for but they do I mean yeah. it's protein for them the whole thing gets used when I shoot a bull elk I don't just cut the head off you know I shoot a 360 bull elk I don't cut the head off and come home all of that meat is taken home all of that meat is taken home and put in in my freezer or my family's freezer or one of the one of the staff members here that wasn't so fortunate's freezer. It all gets consumed. That's the real deal. Yeah. Now, if I can't find that 360 bowl and I eat tag soup, I still have an a, extra cow tag in my pocket. I'll go up to an area that now now we're going to talk about size of the herd. If you really want to take out a if you want to control the size of the herd, shoot the females. Mm-hmm. Because that's a really easy way to control not only this year, but the you, the future generations of that herd. And you have to. Yellowstone is a perfect example of that. Back in the 90s, there was 29,000 head of elk that mm-hmm. lived in Yellowstone. Now I there's know. less than five. It couldn't sustain 29,000 head elk. It's not big enough. The whole ecosystem is not big enough for that. They were eating themselves out of house and home. Mm-hmm. And, then you're, and then you're talking about waste. Now you're talking about elk dying of starvation when they could have been consumed by you know, we have a hunger problem in this world. Why can't they be consumed by that? Yeah. So herd size, cow elk. I'll go shoot a cow elk. If I don't shoot a bull, I'll go shoot a cow elk. Help help that area, help that game and fish manager manage his population size, plus throw meat in the freezer for me and my family all winter. Mm-hmm. So that's why trophy hunting is important. And I think, I think you did a good job explaining the difference between how, like, somebody like you and I see or define trophy hunting yes. versus how it's portrayed. Yeah. You know, like the, 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 uh, the CEO of the humane society of the United States. Yeah. They, th- you're exactly right. Trophy hunting means they, their only goal is to go out and get a picture with, with a big set of antlers, right? This is really weird. The micro, my mic won't stay in the right spot here. Driving <laughs> me crazy. Um, 
yeah. Anyway, we'll deal with that later. <laughs> <laughs> where, where to us, you know, every every hunter defines trophy differently, right? Yep. Um, the way I, I define trophy is, it could be anything from a memory to a giant to a giant mule deer or a giant bull elk um, set of antlers. Now I don't shoot trophies like you do, because I think in your mind you do. Here, here's another thing that I've I, learned I do recently. to me, and that's yeah. what I'm saying is every yeah. hunter defines it differently, right? I'm super. I've got this little. Uh, my, my daughter shot uh, one shot a spike, one shot a little two point whitetail. Yep. Uh, which, by the way, the meat was fantastic. Oh yeah. We talked about it earlier. Uh, every day, I'll take that every day. <laughs> my my girls are so freaking proud of yep. these these antlers because I euro man them. Yeah. Uh, they are so, so to them. I that, saw that on on your Instagram photo. Y- yeah, yeah. That, well, I appreciate you checking it out. Yeah, it was pretty cool. And, and uh, but it's uh, they're they're so proud. So so that is for for the rest of their life. They've got this trophy, and they've got a de- defining moment in their life where where they, they now have a, a memory of what this trophy means to them. What you know, the the deer meat is probably about gone by now. Yeah, I think we're getting pretty low, but. The trophy is is there forever, they, and if I if I if I get struck by lightning tomorrow, they're always going to have that memory that that they were hunting with dad, and this this thing on the wall, this physical thing, you can call that a trophy. Yeah. But it's it's really the entire holistic experience of what hunting is, and that's that's different for each individual, and so that's that's why I guess it's important that we make sure people understand that it is not necessary to demonize trophy hunting. If you're anything like me, you're always looking for ways to improve your elk hunting skills for September. And one of my favorite ways is the Elk Collective. It's an absolute game changer in self-education. This virtual elk hunting course has over 150 videos that cover everything from elk calling, strategy, tips, setup, gear, much, much more. There's a bunch of people involved. Some of the best elk hunters in the woods are involved with the Elk Collective, and they've come together to put together this virtual course to help you notch more tags in September. So check it out at theelkcollective.com and use promo code, all one word, the Western Huntsman, for 20 bucks off the entire course. That makes the course only $69. It's a great deal, and I promise if you go through this course, you will go into the Elk Woods with a lot more confidence and a much better chance at notching a tag on the mighty WAP. Hoffman Boots is the boot choice of the Western Huntsman podcast, and it has been for a very long time. I love my Hoffman in the Explorers, in the 6-inch or the 8-inch. Uh, they have all sorts of options for you to check out. Hoffman Boots is my go-to boot because I am a firm believer that when it comes to gear, the one piece of gear you don't want to skip on is boots get really good boots and if you choose to do some hoffman boots you're going to find out why i highly recommend these hunting boots made by a multi-generational family of shoemakers these boots are made right here in north idaho and i've got an excellent deal for you if you choose to go with hoffman boots use promo code all caps lock huntsman 10 for 10 percent off get you some of these boots and find out why i love them uh, they're totally waterproof. They're going to give you great traction on the mountain. They're super comfortable. There's very little break-in period. Can't recommend hopping boots enough. Check it out, guys. Next on the list is Scree Gear. High-octane hunting attire without breaking the bank. You want to go into the field with good camo, right? You want you want camo that works, that'll keep you dry, that'll keep you comfortable. You want layering systems, the merino wool, the rain gear, all the things that make hunting a little bit easier and allows you to stay in the field a lot longer. The problem with most of it is it's super expensive, not with Scree Gear. Scree Gear will give you all the high-end technical gear that you want without having to take out a second mortgage, and that's why I like it. And to make it even better, I've got a promo code, the Western Huntsman, all one word, and that will give you 15% off and free shipping. It's a heck of a deal, guys. I recommend checking out like their bundle packages. They have like the elk bundle or the whitetail bundle or the turkey bundle. All those bundles come with multiple pieces of gear, and you won't regret getting this gear. It's great stuff. Check out Scree at ScreeGear.com. Oh, and you want to call in an elk? 
use Phelps Game Calls. I've been using Phelps Game Calls since uh, just about the beginning of Phelps Game Calls. It's a great company story, too. This company started in a little garage and is now one of the premier call companies on uh, within the industry. I mean, you can't you can't go wrong with Phelps Game Calls, whether it's turkey calls, predator calls, waterfowl, or especially I think the bread and butter is the elk calls. And I, I use the Maverick. I use the Pink. I use the Gray Amp. Uh, check out the AMP series. If you're new to calling, I recommend getting a couple of different ones and trying them out. Find out which one works best for you. But uh, I promise you I'm not steering you wrong when it comes to Phelps Game Calls. It's a great company full of great people that make excellent products that actually work. And the proof is in the pudding. Call in a lot of elk, and you will too if you trust me, by going to phelpsgamecalls.com. I got Obviously, I got a promo code for you, right? Huntsman 10. Huntsman 10 for 10% off your Phelps Game Calls and check them out. Phelps Game Calls. Get them close. Two last items. Check out the Reveal Cell Cams from Tacticam. Whether it is for hunting or security, these are excellent cell cams that I have all over my property. To include, I uh, I put them on some job sites for some security so people I know if, uh, if they're still in materials or whatever, I'm going to catch them. Uh, and another little promo code I like to throw out there is for Batum907 for anybody that is hunting bears spring or fall and you are allowed to bait. Don't forget to go to Batum907.com. Since made in Alaska, use promo code Huntsman10 for 10% off. The stuff works, and it works well. Let's get back to the show. Here we go. What is that sound? Do you hear that? Yeah. It's like a furnace or something. Anyway, I'm just making sure it wasn't <laughs> Maybe we're wiser. taking off. <laughs> There's a new experience here. <laughs> the, the ground's Keep not it. moving, so I think we're okay. Please make sure you're buckled up. <laughs> um, um, does that make sense? Yeah. So this is an interesting. Everybody has that. that we were talking about this earlier. Everybody has that sister-in-law that asked that question over turkey dinner. Why do you trophy hunt? Or why do you have – this is the one I love. Why do you have that animal in, in – um, you know, on your wall, stuffed on your wall. That's so gross. I don't want to see, I don't want to see that. This, that's the, you know, I don't even come over. I, 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 not, I never, I used to have a sister-in-law that wouldn't come over to our house because there were things stuffed on the wall. That doesn't, that's dumb, absolutely dumb. So here's why. Before there was photo, I mean, I'm going to break this out. When you have, when you ever look at your kids' photos and you, and it, and it instantly brings you back to, you know, feeding your child and their face is all messy or mm-hmm. their first time they went swimming or, you know, whatever it is. First time they rode a bike and you, see, you get to see a photo. And nowadays, I mean, when we were kids, you had like seven photos from you growing up. Now, yeah, I know, right? Hundreds, hundreds, of thousands of photos. I have to really dig yes. to find the photo of my daughter, her first time she cussed. <laughs> you dead. have that. I have it. I have it on video. Mine's a memory <laughs> with me with a really red, red face. But anyway, <laughs> you couldn't see my face. I was filming. <laughs> so. Yeah. so the the interesting thing now, or back then, way back when, they didn't have photos. Maybe they took a trophy photo. You know, there's always the the iconic photo of of uh, Teddy Roosevelt with his rifle and his foot up on a on a Cape Buffalo in yep. Africa, right? But not yep. everybody got to do that. But they did. They took the hide, they took the antlers, and they would they were able to memorialize that animal and that experience on the wall. So every time, is there, if you ever go to a trophy hunter's house, you can tell. Actually, hunter period, they can tell because you sit. In his seat, he can probably. I can pick. I can go into your house and I can pick which one of your fa- or are your favorite animals because mm-hmm. you can you can see them from your chair, and it instantly every time you look at that trophy, it brings back a memory. You can smell whatever it is, the sage. You can mm-hmm. smell the pine. You can you can you can you can feel the wind that was in your face. Hopefully, if you're if you're doing it right, it's always in your face, right? Hopefully, but, but you can. You're thinking. You can. That memorializes that mm-hmm. trophy, that animal. Photos do that now. However, it doesn't do it in 3D like a mount does. Yeah. When I look at my ibex from Mongolia, I was just I literally was just doing this this weekend. I looked back. I was looking at it, and I and my wife walks by and she looks at me with this weird like, "What are you doing? Are you okay? What are you thinking about?" I said, "Oh, I was just I was in Mongolia for a second. Never mind." And mm. just everything I could remember, everything I could feel and 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 touch and hear, all of it was right there instantly. I'll give you a great example of what you're talking about. Uh, 
military wise. Yeah. I have I have tons of pictures of when I was when I was in the military. But I also have a gear bag, a sea bag we called them in yeah. the Marines. And if I dump that out and I'm looking at the old camis and and one of my cami pants has has like this this worn out knee. Yeah. Uh the the reaction and the memory it triggers is totally different than just looking at the pictures. You can feel it, right? Yeah. It's the same if if you uh had a like one of those super great moments on uh, you know little league football and and you get a trophy at the end of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that trophy on the wall gives you a totally different experience than the than the team photo that yep. might be buried in the closet, right? Absolutely. Um and so I think that's a good way to um yeah, yeah to explain that and describe that and and make people understand that I, and I don't think it's hunters that we have to worry about with with no for the most part some hunters are like well you know you trophy what did that guy call me one time he called me a horn honky or something <laughs> horn oh, you honky. horn honky <laughs> and I, I'm not I just was explaining you know in certain areas it's not a terrible idea to, to let show restraint. to let, let let the smaller bucks go you know they're they're kind of struggling. Uh, which is going to lead me to another question, but it's going to challenge both of us. But um, th- th- that's what I was saying. The, the, the hunters are not the biggest thing. The, it, it's, it's these ENA hunters and how they propagate that messaging. And how – we talk about this all the time. It's so difficult to argue like a, a one-liner on Twitter yeah. where it's, it's like trophy hunters slaughter black bear or wolf. Or, or you know, usually it's a predator animal. How do we how do we combat that messaging to the general public? We're not talking about hunters. We're not trying to convince anti-hunters, right? Because we the, those two groups are already there. It's these people in between that don't really have an opinion on hunting. They can be swayed by a tweet. How do well, we combat that? It, there's lots of ways. Organic food. I mean, organic's a big thing right now. You know, it, 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 all of a sudden it became. Uh, it became fashionable to be, you know, to grow your own food and ha- mm-hmm. eat organic and all this stuff. Well, guess what? Uh, if you've been hunting and consuming the meat for generations like you and I have, we've mm-hmm. been eating organic forever. That's one way. The other thing is, <laughs> this is not about this is not about ego as much. Now there is ego involved. Uh, you know, men have egos, and that's what. <laughs> That's what gets us in trouble. It's also what keeps us um, grounded, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Uh, you have too much ego. Somebody punches you in the face, and you no longer have that ego. But there is ego involved. But it's also about uh, su- sustainability. And these herds have to be managed just like your lawn. Yeah. If you don't mow your grass, what happens? If you don't weed your grass, what happens? Weeds take over. Yeah. And and if you don't do that, if we don't do that with wildlife, because I hate to say this, in the Northern North American wildlife conservation model, which is what we are here, you ha- we have to manage them because they cannot manage themselves because there's too much human involvement. And go, well, humans shouldn't be involved. I'm sorry. If you drive down the highway, you're involved. If you live on this continent, you're involved. Yeah. There's no way around it. So the, the high rise they're living in was once habitat. Exactly. Right? So and it, they're it just, pro- it's a it's a dumb sentiment. Yeah. They're producing right. a carbon footprint that changes things. Yeah. So if you want to put your head in the sand and say, We just aren't involved, I'm gonna ignore it. Okay, go ahead. I'm not gonna do that because I know where my meat comes from and I'm going to help manage those herds so that my grandkids and my great grandkids know where their meat comes from. Mm-hmm. Period. And I'm not against ag. Hey, I grew up on a ranch. Farming and ranching, yeah. that's good. That is good stuff. It really is. Because if it wasn't for that, we were talking about the the uh, industrial revolution. If it wasn't for that, our country wouldn't look this this unique. Yeah. Because that's how they fed the generations before us. Partially, the whole reason that the North American wildlife model happened is because we didn't. <laughs> our past generations didn't manage it. They over managed it. It's a pendulum. Mm-hmm. It went the other way. They killed all the buffalo. Well, that's a problem. They killed everything. You know, there was, you name it from elk to mule deer to buffalo to antelope, turkeys, you name it, they were all in trouble. Mm-hmm. They were all in trouble. And now we're building this back. There's never been so many elk on this continent. Yeah. And and that's a that's a huge that's a huge win. We have to manage it. Because if we well, don't 
it's it's it not only goes away, it becomes a problem. Exactly. And and you have to look at that on a on a per capita basis, right? There was a time when there were there there may have been more elk, but there was fewer humans, right? Or right. or more buffalo, but there was fewer humans. Right. Uh and, and so when when these when some of these folks they talk about how we'll just leave them alone and let them manage themselves. And I've said this, uh, listeners are going to start rolling their eyes, but <laughs> sometimes you just kind of got to repeat stuff. You can't. We don't live in that kind of environment. No. We have cities, freeways, reservoirs, railroads, fences, agricultural interface. We yeah. have all these things that humans developed. Unless you go kill off 90% of the population, right? it's not a realistic thing or a realistic thing to say – uh, or allow animals, wildlife, to manage themselves. What do you? No. Th- what do they think Native Americans did before it, all this development was here? They managed the wildlife. And it's not pretty. It's you not. Ever, you ever watch an animal starve to death? It is. Yeah. It is one terrible. of the worst things you can imagine. Just imagine your dog. Imagine your pet starving themselves. Turn that mic just a touch towards you. There you there go. go. Yep. Sorry. Just, um, can you imagine your dog or cat starving to death in front of you? Now, now let's take that by the 80,000 head of elk in in Wyoming, and and you cut. Okay, we're going to manage them. We're going to take every year we have to take 20 percent or 20,000 head of elk out of the out of the pool in order to keep maintain this this population so they don't eat themselves out of house and home. Mm-hmm. If we don't, that 20,000 is going to starve to death. Which really won't be twenty thousand, because by the time they start to starve to death, it'll be a hundred and fifty thousand, and then you're yep. getting rid of sixty thousand exactly. or seventy thousand. That's a that's a that's a that is a, a horrible thought. My grandfather, um, my my mom's dad, grew up in Jackson Hole, and back in Jackson Hole, when he was growing up, it was the poorest county in the country. Oh, Absolutely. really? Oh yeah. Absolutely, the poor. You, you think of that. You think of that Crazy, now today. Right? That's nuts. But if you think about it, in the 30s, there wasn't anything there. Number one, mm-hmm. it was during it was during the Great Depression. Number two, true, there was nothing to do there in the winter. One, you know, in the summer there was a little bit of tourism. There was cattle ranching. That was it. And mm. when winter rolled around, you hoped you you could kill an elk or something and survive the winter. Yeah. He yeah. tells stories that before they put the elk refuges in. He, he, they lived way out of town on a rich man's ranch. My great grandfather managed this place. They, he tells stories that winters after winter for like five or six winters, when he was a young boy, he could walk from Jackson hole out to the ranch, which is about 15 miles. And he would do it every weekend. They'd board during the school. And then every weekend they'd go home. He could walk from elk carcass to elk carcass all the way home. Never touch the snow because they all starved to death. No kidding. That's why they put the elk refuge in there. Yeah. That's why it's so important because if you take that away, that whole elk, that's how they managed, that's how the the elk were managed prior to. Yeah. Then they went in there, started ranching that area, and they cut all the hay so those elk mm. had nothing to eat all winter. Yeah. They cut yeah. all the grass, and by the time winter rolled around, they were feeding it to their cows, and the elk starved to death. I want to – let's uh, – because you're exactly right. And there's – yeah. The, the other aspect to that is that the population increases the – what was that study or, or paper I was reading about? The uh, the highway kill on, on big game. Um, tremendous. It, it's a, like – that's what it was, Yellowstone back in the 90s. Yeah. The elk that were being killed around the park was like astronomical oh, yeah. on the highway. That's a terrible death. Um, uh, but let's shift gears here be, because we're, we're talking about trophy hunting a little okay. bit, right? Um, you mentioned the North American model of wildlife conservation. Yep. Uh, I had one of the authors of that on the show one time. And Did you? It, Dr. Valerius Geis. Are oh, you yeah. familiar with him? Oh, yeah. So he has this interesting theory, or he had this interesting theory. Um, Dr. Geis, we lost... It still fact, exists. It a, He's just not around. Yeah, to, to yeah. He about. passed away, but in fact, it was about a year ago. Yes. Um, so... The theory is when it because I was asking him the question. I'm trying to make sure I word this right. When I was asking him the question in where where whitetail and mule deer coexist, right? The whitetail tend to outperform or out out thrive the mule deer, right? And the reason is is the um, if there are no larger bucks to protect the the mule deer does, the whitetail bucks will breed the mule deer does, and essentially. Those don't survive past a year is what Dr. Valeris guys was saying. Um, they, they they don't make it in the wild. They do fine in, in captivity. 
So he said the solution and the study that they did was to um, allow to pass on the larger bucks. So it needs to be a four point or better. I'm, I, bear with me. I'm really trying to pull this out of my memory <laughs> here, uh, but it speaks to what we were talking about earlier. Um, a four point or better allow those mule deer bucks to to survive. Uh, you know, pass on them in terms of hunting. Shoot the shoot the younger bucks because the younger bucks cannot protect the mule deer does from the white tail bucks. But if those big bucks are around, they'll protect the mule deer does. Hence, they'll end up breeding them. And it will uh, allow that breeding cycle to take place without any interruption. And they won't have these hybrid deer that don't survive past a year in the wild. And the reason why they don't survive is is, uh, pretty interesting. But you have to listen to that episode. Um, Then what episode? Do you remember what episode? I don't remember what name it was, but just jump. It had been a couple years ago. It was. It was was the October prior to him passing. Okay. So I believe 2020. Um, so that's, that's when I had him on the show. So guys, you can jump on there and go back, uh, and just, just find, just search for the Dr. Valerius Geist <laughs> episode and it'll, it'll pop up super interesting stuff. But his take was, this is super unpopular with hunters, but you want to let if, and this is only in areas where whitetail and mule right. deer coexist, not in yep. mule deer. Like I, I grew up in Utah that we only had mule deer, right. uh, you know, there's areas that only have whitetail. So n- not, not applicable there, but in those cases, let the more mature bucks live and shoot the younger bucks. What what do you say to that and how that relates to uh, this this trof- trophy hunting concept? So I think that's an interesting take. <coughs> Obviously, it's very um, unique to certain areas. Mm-hmm. Um, doesn't mean that it's across the board. I would I would the one thing I would ask if obviously if if he was still with us I would ask him if that's the case. Um, why are the, why, so if you've ever seen mule deer and whitetail breed at the same time, I'm talking in the same field as, as they, cause they have slightly different gestations, slightly different ruts. Yeah. Mule deer's, they're a, off, mule yeah. deer's a little earlier, yep. whitetail's a little later. They, they do butt right up against each other. But if you've ever seen them do it at the same time, it's really unique. Um, mule deer are very, they, they, chase the does, they court the does, they chase the does, they chase the does. And when they do it, done, bam, on. That's it. Going on. We're doing something Moving else on now. With life. Yep. The next mm-hmm. doe, here we go. Mm-hmm. Whitetail, they're very protective and they, they court the does, but it's very quick. And then they, they hang out with the doe for a while in hopes to do it again. So so mm-hmm. one of the unique things, I think, in, in, in seeing this happen a couple times in my life is – that that I saw this in Nebraska one time. A buck bred the doe, left the doe, went to find another doe. This was um, a white tail or a mule deer? Oh, uh, I'm sorry, a mule deer. Okay. Bred okay. the doe, left the doe, went to find a new doe. A white tail buck came in and bred the doe like minutes later. Same no exact doe. Now you tell me, how does that work in, in in an organism? How does that work? Which one is which one is which? Is it like cats where the, it could be could be like multiple fathers for for one litter of cats kind of thing? I or, don't know. I don't. Do know you either. have twins and one's a white tail, one's a buck or a mule uh, deer? No I don't idea. know. No but idea. But <laughs> I would say that I would say you can't you can't make that statement across the board. Like yeah. you said, it's unique in this current situation. And if if you you know you got that's why one of the things that, that my father instilled in us is we're not hunters. We're actually outdoors people. He used to, he, as a kid, I was I always shook my head like, what are you doing? We would drive. We didn't take very many family vacations because we were. He was very busy, you know, starting this company and, mm-hmm. and after <clears throat> all of that. And but we did. My grandparents lived over here in Cody, and we lived in Jackson at the time when I was ten. Before that, eight, seven. We'd drive from Jackson to Cody and drive through the park. When you drive through the park, it's a unique experience, water wise, because you start. And the water on the Jackson side goes to the Columbia. Mm-hmm. And then you water, you come over the divide and the water here goes to the Mississippi. He would constantly pick us up. Where, what, what river is this? This is the North Fork of the Shoshone. What, where, how, what ocean does it go in and tell me the rivers that it touches on the way down? We'd have to tell him that. That's, that's, that we didn't play hmm, the, we I'm didn't play liking the, your dad, man. we didn't play the license plate game. We played that. Yeah, or yeah. he'd go, Oh, look, there's a porcupine. When do they breed? Ah. Uh, they rut in August, you know, all this, huh. all these little trivia. And the reason is because we're out, we're outdoorsmen. We're not just hunters. 
when you're sitting there on the hillside, you should know what's going on around you. My point is, when you're sitting in a field and you're looking at at whitetail bucks and mule deer bucks and they're breeding in the same time, yeah, maybe there needs to be some some constraint on the older on the older bucks, or at least the breeding age bucks. Yeah, I think that's the key because, like you said, once they get to the certain age, you know, they're 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 aggressive, they're, but not they're <laughs> yeah, they're doing more damage to the breeding cycle than they are any good, right? And right. So, um, I I think that. It's also going to be dependent, like Wyoming, where we're at, where, here, Powell, Wyoming, yep. uh, you know, this Cody, Wyoming area or yep. whatever, whatever yep. you want to call it. Last night, we're, we're driving in. I've got my wife and my kids with me. And uh, it's it's funny. That's why I, I said I, I really like your dad. <laughs> uh, giant mule deer. You know, we're, we we come in at about midnight and, yep. and cross the Montana line. Huge mule deer um, standing on the side of the road. And, and I asked the girls... Um, which uh, they shouldn't have even been awake at this point, but they were. And, uh, <laughs> is that a whitetail or a mule deer? And both of them nailed it. Mule deer, right there. Uh, right, and we don't see a lot of mule deer where I live. Right. You know, there it's it's mainly it's it's pretty whitetail heavy. Yep. But it, it hasn't always been that way. And so, I think that like what Dr. Geis was talking about is going to be a lot more applicable in North Idaho, where mule deer used to be a lot more prominent, uh, and now you only find them in the in the high country, uh, where here. I'm noticing that, like, if you were to compare here, that that highway I'm driving into is kind of that agricultural interface, yep. right? Um, down low, what you would consider low uh, versus up in the mountains, yep. you wouldn't see a mule deer like that in North Idaho. You won't see them down on the highway. Um, you only see them up high. And and then you go to like Arizona, and that's flopped. Arizona, you know, you're gonna see the the, the little white tail coos bucks yeah. uh, down low, and the uh, and the or um, vice versa up high, and then the mule deer down low. Right. Point is, is I don't think that there's one like specific answer to solve all these conservation no. issues, right? Is it, like what works in North Idaho isn't gonna work in 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 Wyoming versus Montana versus Utah and Colorado, um, and I I, I think that uh, that kind of speaks to how hunters hunt too. He, regionally we all have yeah. different goals um personality wise experience wise we all have these different goals and so when we're 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 talking about trophy hunting i, I i'm i think the goal of this conversation is to try to get people to stop cringing when they hear that term because if it's done appropriately responsibly uh from a true outdoorsman and legally um, the and other legally, thing is legal it's legal yeah uh and and we're we're doing it in a way. Well, I, I say we. I'm no trophy hunter, man. <laughs> I'm not, now, so I'm gonna, I'm I might ask have you a to question. come down to Wyoming and become a trophy hunter because. So, so let me ask you this question. You say I'm not a trophy hunter, but you obviously you show restraint. You don't shoot the first deer you see that's legal, yeah. correct? Nope. So that's trophy hunting. You're showing restraint. That's all it is. No, you're exactly right. I I think what I'm trying to say is I'm not comparing my skill of shooting the the caliber of bucks that you've gotten and and uh, a lot of people here in this building. I don't get. I I don't. I'm not. You don't live in Wyoming. It's it's a great place. It could be. It could be. Could be. But but let me let me so let me ask you this. Okay. Well, actually, let me share a story. There's a gal that works for us. That came to us and she had only hunted a couple times in her life ever. Um, she came to us, works in the video department, and um, went along with us on a couple hunts, videoing us, and was and was very curious about the trophy hunting side of the world. She came from a non-hunting family, um, understood, and she started hunting because of self sustainability. That was okay. it. Meat period. That, that was that, that was her. That's how she entered the, the entry yep. point. Yeah, yeah. Which is great. And mm. and we encouraged it and helped her, you know, hey, here's cow elk, here's here's how, here, you know, she'd come to the office all, you know, she'd hunt in the morning and be distraught. She couldn't shoot a cow or couldn't get her, her uh, doe deer or whatever for meat. And, and we'd help her, you know, suggestions and all that stuff. Over the eight years that she's been with us, she went from just wanting, oh, I, I, don't, I only shoot stuff for meat. That's, that's, what, that's what I do, just shoot stuff for meat. Then she shot her first buck, and it was like the best day ever, ever. She shoots this, and it's on her wall. It's it, it's on her wall, and it is it's fantastic. I mean, it's it's in her office. Mm-hmm. Then she says, "I think I want to shoot a bigger buck this year." 
and then a bigger buck. And then she passed up on a whitetail to shoot a, a smaller mule deer. Uh-huh. And that's what keeps you up at night. A really like a 160 whitetail to shoot a 120, 130 mule deer. Yeah. And it's been keeping her up ever since. And now she's progressed into what I would consider a pretty accomplished trophy hunter. She's shooting mature, old mature bucks and showing restraint. Hmm. The my point is is trophy hunting isn't either or. Sometimes it's a progression. Sometimes it's what your uh, what your availability is. You know, you guys have a lot more whitetail. Well, of course you're not going to have a 200 inch mule deer. That's not where you live. Yeah, exactly. I live 45 minutes from 200 inch mule deer habitat. That's that's you do. One Rest of the sure, reasons I, I, I live I, here. I found that out last night, <laughs> and uh, I've been looking at some real estate. Kind of surprised. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. Wyoming is closed. <laughs> Wyoming is so is Idaho. Let's send them all to Montana, right? I, I, Montana. Montana's a great place. Lots of hunting opportunity. Great place. Great schools. Great. Yep, yep. Uh, Not a lot of taxes. Yeah, it's, there's it's no great. grizzly bears. Nope. 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 Yeah. We, my brother-in-law has a shirt that says, Wyoming is not real. <laughs> he wears it on vacation. <laughs> I need to make one of those for Idaho, yeah, man. <laughs> absolutely. So the point is, is it's it's not just, you know, it's not just, are you my trophy hunter? Am I not a trophy hunter? It's really a progression, and yeah. you'll see it. And you, I've watched it in my grandfather, and I watched it in my father. I'm starting to watch it in the next generation where... They get to the point where, okay, I've, I've accomplished everything I've wanted. I've, mm-hmm. I've, I've taken the trophies that I had, you know, beyond my dreams, beyond what I really wanted. And now I just want to go along. Mm-hmm. And, and you hear stories or read the stories in, in magazines or on Instagram where, yeah, oh, dad, he, he came up and just helped us at camp. And, you know, we had, we ate really good, man. That, that yeah. guy can really cook or he always had the, the firewood cut I kind or of whatever. Miss those kind of camps. Yeah. Yeah. There's always that guy. And yeah. I think that's the next step. I want to be involved, but I don't need to pull the trigger. Sure. I want to be involved. And man, if you had some extra steaks, that sure be nice because me and your mother would, would eat them yeah. kind of thing. But they don't want to, they don't want the hard work. They, they you know, they don't want to embrace the suck like they used to mm-hmm. living on a sleeping bag in a, in a pup tent, you know, freezing their butt off, waiting for that moment when the storm breaks so they can get out and take that, take yeah. that animal. So. Hmm. It's it's a progression. It's it not is. Is either or. And we can all define what what we set our goal as a trophy hunter to be, right? Like yeah. like for me, if I get a four or a nice uh, a nice five point one twenty one thirty one forty would be pushing it. Mule deer in North Idaho. You've done I'd something. I'd be tickled, man. Yeah. I mean, I would be tickled. I'd be I'd be texting you pictures. Like, yeah, absolutely. What do you think of this, man? Yeah. And, and absolutely. you'd be laughing at me. No, hey, I'd go, hey, cool. in that area? But <laughs> that's that's doing something. And so it's it's just all relative is the point. And so I, I hope we helped kind of um, alleviate yeah. some some people's kind of perceptions as to, to what the trophy thing is, what the trophy hunt is. Uh, or what a trophy hunter is, yeah. because there's some positive that comes out of it, and it's not, it's not. We we cannot, as hunters and outdoorsmen, allow these um, these media outlets that come out of places that have no idea of what the reality of being yep. an outdoorsman or a hunter is define us. They can't. We can't allow the Humane Society of the United States or PETA to define who we yep. are. And they're, they're doing that by labeling us. And they're the ones that are always talking about, you know, they come from the left. They're always out there. <laughs> oh, you can't label, you, you can't do this or your, uh, what, insert your typical freaking stupid name that they come up with bigot, uh, you yeah. know, whatever. Don't label me. I'm yeah, a he yeah. or she. Yeah. Wait, what? Yeah. They, I, you they, just labeled they, yourself. You, you're, you're the ones labeling yourself. So, and, and it's, it, there's so much hypocrisy involved with that. As outdoorsmen, we can't let them do that to us. Right. And so I, I found we, we just throw it right back. You know how they use the term bigot all the time. Yeah. I throw it right back at them. Like your perception of, of hunting is exactly how bigotry is defined. Yes. Grow up. Anyway. Yeah. Get educated. <laughs> I appreciate it, man. That was Thank fun you. having you on. Yeah. This is uh, that Thank was an aw- awesome conversation. I like to I like to come out of these podcasts feeling like we kind of solved something or answered a, a, a deeper question, and I feel like we did that here. Yeah. Well, you so. know, if those if your if your uh, audience is out there has any other questions, comments. I always love comments. That yeah. If nothing else, they're a, they're worth a chuckle. They are. So, yeah. For sure. Know, find me on find me on social media, Eastman's Hunting Journals or Ike Ike Eastman. Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. Yeah, and I'll put all that in the show notes, guys. So check it out on Instagram, uh, YouTube, uh, Eastman's yeah. on, on YouTube, uh, all the 
all the stuff is out there. It'll be in the show notes. Uh, maybe you guys have like a link tree or something. Oh, yeah. You can even put it Absolutely. in there. So cool. Well, I appreciate you joining me, man. Great Thanks, episode. Jim. Thanks for coming down. Thank you. You made it all the way to the end. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. We sure appreciate your support. This is Jim Huntsman signing off and reminding you to check us out at Instagram at The Western Huntsman and on Facebook at The Western Huntsman. And you can also check out the website at thewesternhuntsman.com. Thanks again. We'll see you guys next time. Stay Western, and I'll see you on the mountain.